Well, collectors, here we are again. It's now uh, January the 23rd, 2021. And I have to point out that it's, um, it's a year now uh, since we've been doing these YouTube presentations on dagger authenticity. And I know you've all enjoyed it because I've gotten tons of email. And we've come up with kind of a unique idea this time. Um, uh, I always wanted to deal with etched bayonets, but the subject is just so vast uh, that I'm really lucky I got a partner here, Mr. Matt Janowski. Uh, he could be a little shorter, but we'll let that pass. But we always have, if you give me any trouble, I, you know, I got my man here. But Matt is an um, ardent collector. Um, he has specialized in etched bayonets, and um, I just want him to maybe give you a little background on himself. How did you start collecting, Matt? Oh, geez, back in the uh, early 90s, I was working for a beer distributor uh, up in Rochester, New York, and uh, was a route guy, which meant you called on three stores. You ordered the beer, the beer came the next day, you put it up, and that was it. Wake up, repeat. And on my way to the back room one day, I have an empty runner of empty beer boxes. And a gentleman walks by me and just kicks them all off and he goes, break down your effing boxes. And now I said, this was in the Wegman store. This was in the Wegman store. Up in Rochester. Up in, up, up, up in Rochester. So and, and who do you think this guy was? His name was Mike Polizzi. Now, you, some of you collectors, maybe a lot of you collectors, know Mike Polisi. He's an advanced collector, uh, one of my best friends, if not my best friend for years. He always runs my Mac Show stand, so you probably know him from there. He's the guy I had to talk to when he want the price lowered. <laughs> he always he'd wait till I turn my back and then lower the price for you. But go ahead, uh, Matt, tell us about what happened then. Well, this guy kicks these boxes kicks out. Kicks the boxes off, so I didn't know that there was an etiquette before you went back to the bailer to knock down your boxes. So my <laughs> next runner through, I broke down all the boxes and headed back to the bailer. And doesn't he walk by again and he kicks them off? He goes, don't you forget it. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, boy, this guy. Mike is a wise guy. I know, boy, we're going to have a problem. Well, a few days goes by, I don't see him. And he just comes up to me and he goes, I was just busting your uh, stones. He goes, what's your name? I said, I'm Matt Janowski. He introduces uh, himself. He asks if I had a girlfriend. I said, yeah. He goes, uh, you have any pictures of her naked? And I, I, I said, no. He goes, you want to buy some? Mike said, is the original wise guy. Just absolutely. He and I just absolutely hit it off. And a couple weeks later, he invited me over to... Uh, uh, his house. I actually, oh, let me uh, take that back. After the uh, girlfriend comment, he did the 180 uh, pivot to uh, military, asked me if I had any relatives that were in World War II, and uh, I told him that my great-grandfather served over in the European theater and asked if he brought back any souvenirs, and I said, yeah, he brought back an armband. He goes, would you mind if I see it? I said, sure. So uh, next time I was home, my mom had it in her jewelry box, and I brought it back to show Mike, and it was just a regular SA and SDAP, early three-piece construction with the RZM tag, and he told me about it, and um, eventually he just said, uh, why don't I invite you over to my house? So I go to his house, I walk up these great so stairs. So this is from kicking your boxes over to now you're invited to his house. This is how collectors are. As soon as they smell something, yep. this is what they are. I walk up his stairs and I go into his collecting room, and from there, it was just, what am I looking at? There's just these beautiful daggers. There must have been 30 of them in cases. There were standards. There were mannequins with uniforms, full full tunics, HJ displays with the trumpet banner and the trumpets and everything. And he led me over to the back part of his uh, display room where he had a antique uh, draftsman's flat file case. Must have been from the 20s, must have weighed 400 pounds, probably about five foot high, six foot wide, four foot deep. 12 or 15 shelves, so he pulls out the first one, laid with beautiful red felt. There was about 12 or 15 etched bayonets, all acorn. 
and I'm just looking in, and I'm just I'm just blown away. He closes it, he opens up another one. Again, all etched bayonets. It was from there. I, I just I just want to interrupt and and say that you could open a drawer like that to some accountant or some lawyer, and uh, oh yeah, it's a it's a hunk of metal. But there's something. Uh, I don't know what it is. We have a defect in us, a bad chromosome, but collectors somehow, when they see that, it does something to you. I knew from and that. It did something to I you. I knew from that moment on, Tom. That's what I was going to do. And see, isn't that something? And I'm sure a lot of you other collectors, it just took one thing yep. to get you started. And uh, Mike is an icorn purist, so of course yeah. all of his daggers were. Icorn, yeah. um, bayonets were uh, icorn, and he, and, he, and he pulls me together and he says, Matt, there's only three things you have to know about this hobby. Condition, condition, and condition. Let's see, can I remember that? I think he could, but in, but in today's little lecture, um, there's only two things that you need to know about these uh, etch bayonets. Condition and rarity. Yeah. What, what Matt is... Uh, is inferring if you have the rarest bayonet in the world and it may not be in the condition you like the hilt may be pitted the scabbard is bent uh, but something like that is worth keeping you have to make an exception now and again so yes sir no just uh he really took a liking to me and he took me under his wing and showed me the ins and outs of daggers and great. bayonets and Good old Mike Pelizzi, I'll yeah. tell you, uh, he's, a, he's a great guy. If you don't know him, uh, maybe eventually you will, because he's a lot of fun. So with that, um, before we start the um, seminar on etched bayonets, um, Matt now has been in this a long time, and he's learned an incredible amount. Uh, and besides just collecting etched bayonets, uh, he has a couple of... Um, well, more than a couple uh, other nice pieces that he brought down, and we thought we'd like to uh, walk over and just show you them so that you know that Matt is a serious guy. So let's go over here, and uh, Robbie can put the camera on some of this cool stuff. All right, we're going to uh, we're going to show you uh, a few of um, Matt's prizes here, and. Uh, I think we'll we'll start out with um, uh, his full room. Uh, it's not a it's not a mint dagger, uh, but it's in uh, nice overall condition. And you guys that study grips and cross guards, you can see right away that it's an icorn piece. And uh, I'll show you what the blade looks like here. That's the uh, the forward with the Alles für Deutschland motto and then on the reverse it's got a wonderful uh, full room etch uh, with a small oval, double oval trademark which we all like to see and this is uh, full rooms I mean we all want one um, they are fairly rare but they are uh, obtainable uh, depends on your pocketbook I guess and like um, Matt had said, uh, uh, condition, condition, condition. Uh, you can buy a, a full room for twenty-five hundred, and you can also buy one for ten or twelve thousand. So you know what I mean by that. So that's what we have there, and uh, uh, the nice Tino here. Uh, this in, is in about as nice a condition as you'll be able to find. It's not fully mint, but it's very close to it with no flaking, a beautiful pommel cap, nice orange grip, beautiful grip eagle. And one thing you like to see on Tino officers is as much of the original black on the scabbard as possible. And what's really nice about this piece too, I don't think the camera can get it, but uh, the piece has a stamped number on it. We see them both ways with etches and stamp numbers, and we believe the stamp numbers were earlier than the etches. And then on the reverse, they have the, um, the Tino Eagle, 
and the uh, 3541 Icorn trademark. So that's a nice dagger that uh, every advanced collector ought to have one. And along with it, um, Matt has uh, some really interesting hangers here. Uh, these are the um, uh, standard brocade hangers that were worn for full dress. And uh, during work times, theoretically, uh, these Tino guys wore black leather straps. Um, this set is particularly interesting because it has the original belt loop with it and all that's, that's marked. Um, and Matt also has a set of Tino straps here that are in brown leather. Uh, we do not know what the purpose of that was, but looking at the way they're made, the age of the leather, the usage signs, and so forth, uh, these are original straps. So there's always going to be things that we ponder about in this hobby. We'll never learn everything, but we try. Every year we earn, we earn a little bit more. Um, this is probably one of the, the best um, Icorn government officials that I've ever seen. Uh, the patina on it is just fantastic. But as you probably already noticed, look at those grip plates. My God, aren't they something? Uh, as we know, they were made to resemble mother of pearl, but the, uh, the base material was uh, celluloid, and celluloid turned color uh, depending on the amount of light that it was exposed to over the years. So this baby must have been hanging out of a, uh, a drawer in an attic window where the sun was coming in. I don't know, but it's, uh, it just makes for an absolute... Uh, spectacular dagger. Uh, and then uh, lastly, um, this is uh, uh, just a, a fantastic RLB officer. And you go, oh, okay, it's an RLB officer. I've seen a lot of them, but uh, what's with that icorn tag on it? I never heard of an icorn RLB dagger. Well, uh, in icorn's catalog, which I'll show you Real quickly, uh, in the page in the Kundendienst, they show a drawing of a RLB uh, officer, and um, nobody's ever seen one except for this dagger, which cropped up about maybe 20 years ago. Um, and you'll see something for the first time for most of you here. There is a 3541 Icorn trademark. Ultra, ultra rare. Virtually one of a kind. I mean, you, there may be a couple others in the world. I don't know, but I've never seen them. And the dagger is accompanied with the original uh, RLB hangers that were also made for it. So that's a, that's a real killer, especially considering the condition. All the silvering is still behind the, um, uh, the grip button, and the enamel is perfect. It hadn't been uh, hit on a urinal yet, so it's, uh, it's in great shape. And uh, before we leave the subject, uh, I'm not going to let Matt be the only bragger here. Uh, I got a dagger last week that I that I think is just um, a phenomenal piece. Uh, it's in a uh, Johnson um, reproduction case, but just feast your eyes on that. The dagger, it's an RLB officer, uh, and it has a small roses damask blade uh, with a gilded motto. Uh, just absolutely gorgeous. The Damascus uh, is so incredible that it looks like it's moving. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I'll show you the reverse, too, of it. I mean, it is just uh, just phenomenal. Very, very incredible. Uh, and when you take the grip plates off, uh, the tang is uh, stamped Hector Damasciner, P plus D, uh, which equates to uh, Paul Dinger, 
uh, the Damascus smith that made the Herman Goering wedding sword. So this was absolutely the best of the best that could ever be uh, acquired during the period. And I must say it's probably the, the best of the best that you can uh, add for your collection too. It's a, just a, a wonderful dagger. Uh, it was owned by a late friend of mine, an advanced collector, uh, Joe Santucci. And it's uh, part of his estate. And um, we were able to acquire it here and uh, we're thrilled to have it. A really beautiful dagger. So with that then, we're going to start our presentation on etched bayonets. It's going to be kind of long, so you can always turn off your TV set for a while and come back later. Uh, but we're going to break it into segments. And uh, Matt is going to uh, go over now what, what we're going to cover. Uh, so stick with us. Okay, uh, now we're going to uh, begin our um, presentation on um, etched bayonets. And uh, before I uh, turn things over to Matt, uh, I just want to say one thing. Over the years, uh, I've heard collectors refer to these bayonets as engraved bayonets. That is not the proper term, and it should not be used. These bayonets were etched with acid. There's no such thing as engraved bayonets. So collectors, if you want to be proper, uh, remember they're etched, not engraved. And with that, I want to turn things um, over to Matt, and he's going to take it from here and talk a little bit about Mr. Wayne Teckett. Wayne Teckett. Who we wouldn't be here without Wayne. No. Go ahead, tell us about Wayne. Well, Wayne, Wayne Teckett's just been a, a fabulous guy to know throughout the years. He's, uh, with, with his phone calls and his book, has probably you know saved me you know ten tens of thousands of dollars and let me repeat not ten thousand dollars tens of thousands of dollars so in today's presentation we're going to be concentrating primarily on the KS 98 with military citations in memory of my service time we're not going to go into the the shooting prizes or any special dedications we might touch on a couple special orders but the basic things to look for in these categories that we're going to present here today just had to present again with just the military citations. Um, before I go any further, I was, always want to say that um, through the people I know and collectors, they've always considered the etched bayonet to be the red-headed stepchild of the hobby. It always goes daggers, swords, and etched bayonets. And I always asked myself why and I asked other collectors why and they said because the fakes are so good there's and people don't know what to look for but if you become a student you buy Wayne's book and you learn they're very the fakes are very easy to spot and what we're going to go through today is going to help you educate yourself to make better decisions when you want to go out and buy an etch bayonet. I just might add, too, that in Wayne's book, his photography is phenomenal, and you can see all the minute details of every bayonet. Uh, well, not every, nobody will ever find every bayonet, but 95%, at least, of the bayonets uh, that we see are in Wayne's book, along with um, uh, great explanations about how certain makers did their etches, the different the bookend designs that supersede the etch, and this kind of thing. Um, again, Wayne is a genius. He spent years researching this subject, and the nice part about a book like this is it never gets old. The information was the same in 2002 when he wrote it as it is today in 2021. This book is as fresh today as it was when it was published in, in 2002. The only exception is the value the value rating, where he might have uh, mentioned something as, as common, which still be common, or something that was seldom seen, uh, now might be very rare. We'll show an example uh, here in the lecture of one that he just wrote down as seldom seen, and he told me the other day, he goes, I haven't seen one since. So, but anyway, 
as fresh today as it was 20 years ago. And there's over 30 years of his due diligence and study that's been put into this we, we book. Can't, we can't give more credit to Wayne. I mean, he just, uh, had he not done this book, people would still be floundering with that spanets. And, yeah. and if you get this book and read it and study it and watch our lecture too, <laughs> uh, you'll know a lot about these things. The Bible. The Bible, the, yeah. The Bible. So we might want to start out with who produced these spanets. Okay. Um, not a lot of people know, but in any etched bayonet that is um, produced, there were only five manufacturers of etched bayonets. And that was the Carl Eichhorn firm, the Pack firm, the Puma firm, the Class firm, and the Holler, Holler firm. firm. And from there, they were the producers, and then retailers would buy from them. And we will go on here later on in the lecture to show you the parent company relationship and who made etches for whoever else. This is not to say that you won't find bayonets with other trademarks, but when you do find them, you'll find that there's some kind of a mixture of one of these five producers somewhere in the etch. So one of these five producers virtually uh, produced all of the bayonets, but just added the trademark and and the variation yeah. for the manufacturer mark you see on the blade. Does everybody understand that? And we can and we can really simplify it from there because we we now know that um, these uh, five uh, manufacturers they did not share their uh, uh, trades, and the Icorn Company and the Puma Company just did their own. No other retailers bought from Icorn or Puma. Don't want to get too deep down into the weeds, but you know, Pack basically just did their own, but the uh, Steyer firm did contract with them for a couple bayonets. Um, well, yeah. Like I said, we'll get down into the weeds on this. Oh, like everything in this hobby, you can't say no all the time. There's always an exception, but, uh, but in general, in general. Uh, what Matt's saying is true. So let's start out with um, we're going to start with Icorn bayonets, and we've um, we've picked out uh, quite a few of um, the basics. And uh, what we've done to, to try to save time, um, where we show basic etches, um, where there was a uh, double etch, we tried to include that too. Which uh, we don't want you to think that uh, uh, double etches are common by any means, because they're not. Um, what did we say? We, we felt like maybe one in 15 bayonets that was purchased was, was probably etched, and maybe one in 100 was double etched, because these things were expensive at the time. Remember these, these army guys, they were all NCOs, they didn't have a lot of money, so that's why these things are rare. So go ahead, do your thing. All right. Well, we're going to start out with uh, a short and long model made by Carl Eichhorn. This is known as the 3219 pattern. You'll notice on the longer model, you have the floor deli bookends near the ricasso and towards the tip. And on the shorter model, you just see where it just has a very flat bookend. Make that perfectly clear. That was to keep the etch from too cumbersome on a short model. Correct. And just to show that they did do doubles, that this one um, is attributed to a uh, mountain division in Mitterwald. Mitterwald, by the way, is a very small town in the Alps in Bavaria. We'll flip over the long one, and this one is a, a pioneer division um, to the town of Lutzen, if you can see that. Which is a very rare bayonet because we don't see many pioneer bayonets. No. 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 So, to, just to reiterate, yeah, this is a, the most common etch you'll see, the 3219. But when you find them with uh, double etchings and then to rare groups, uh, they become really quite uh, oh. quite dear. Yes, sir. 
All right, moving on, uh, we come to the model 3220, which was the infantry. Again, same as the long and short on your, on your longer miles, you have the floor de lis on the ends. And on the short uh, NCO model, no bookend. Do a quick flip. And this was attributed to an infantry division, I believe. I can read upside down. Uh, Alpha Corps, it's a um, uh, reconnaissance. Reconnaissance. Yeah. I might say before we uh, we go too far, too, when you when you look at this etch, you say, well, how do you know it's an infantry etch? It has a set of cross rifles with a helmet on the end instead of a repeat of the Wehrmacht Eagle that yeah. the uh, 3219 model has. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no. That's why and, I'm here. That's why. <laughs> and again, we have a longer uh, 3220 with the cross rifles. And this one happens to be on a what we call a pioneer hilt. Um, not seen. See the, see, the pioneer hilt is different from a normal hilt. Uh, see that the pommel is not pointed and the cross guard quillen is cut short. Now, we call these a pioneer bayonet. Um, Pack is the only one that identifies them in their line as a pioneer model. No one else did. Uh, the other producers uh, sold them as just an option. So you will find pioneer um, bayonets, so-called, uh, with another uh, type of regimen on the reverse sometimes. Yes, sir. And then just think of this one might be a, a double. And uh, yes, she is. Again, an, another double etch attributed to, again, that is an infantry. Which has nothing to do with Pioneer. No. So there we see that, that that is the case. Just another option. Yep. All right. These next three, um, I wanted to show, they're, again, they're very um, common 3219s with the uh, double Wehrmacht Eagle, but they're all attributed to a reconnaissance squadron, um, and there were, there were four of them. And I have two, three, and four, so if anybody out there has got the first one, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> That'll cost you, too. That'll cost you. <laughs> Well, that's it with this hobby. No matter how advanced you are, there's always something. Always that something. You need. And when always you, and, and in Wayne's book, he yeah. has the first one, and he has it listed as common. You yeah, think so in you twenty? Know, you yeah. think in twenty years I can find one? There, the, there makes the point of just we, what we just said. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on, we're going to come to um, a very rare one. This was um, a Luftwaffe etch that didn't make the Icorn catalog. Therefore, it has no number, but this is the etch that has the two gulls flying away. Again, longer blade um, with the two fleur de lis bookends. And this one, unfortunately, is just a single. But don't. Oh, too bad. Yeah, <laughs> so you don't run across those too often, but they are out there. And what's the next one then? All right, next one we are coming into the number 3230. Bottom Wehrmacht Eagle, and on top we have the Wehrmacht Eagle. Um, a rare piece, um, just don't see too, too many of them. Not the, not the Wehrmacht eagle, uh, the, the Luftwaffe eagle. The Wehrmacht eagle on the bottom, but the, on, the on, on the top is, the Luft is on the uh, top. And then a cousin of that bayonet is the 3231, which again on top has your Luftwaffe eagle. But down at the bottom, instead of the Wehrmacht Eagle, we have this, I don't know, it might be a C-31 airplane flying over a little village. Just a super neat piece. Very rare, rare to see, too. Rare. Very rare to see. And then to find in this kind of condition, just a, ple a pleasure to own. 
Yeah. Just an absolute pleasure to own. I hope the camera can see that little airplane because it's a very interesting etch. <coughs> then from here we get into your model 3221. And this was the artillery. Um, I broke both uh, long and short. Um, here we've got the, again, the mock eagle at the bottom, and on top we've got the cannon in a, in a wreath. It's kind of hard to see, but the cannon is right in the center of the wreath. And also a bayonet that uh, you'd think, gee, artillery, it should be common, but it really isn't. It's not that common. No, no. Wayne, Wayne has these uh, marked as rare. Yeah, they, and, they are. And they so, are. And so when uh, about 10 months ago, this uh, artillery bayonet came up on, on his site, artillery, but it happened to be a double etch. First one I've ever seen. So, of course, I had to call Wayne up and say, what do you got to have for it? So, is it, it, And then when you got up off the floor, uh, you bought it. I bought it. <laughs> but when, when you have this disease and sickness, you really can't put a, you really can't put a price yeah. on it. Yeah, when you want it, you want it. All right, and then we get on to... This is uh, the most interesting bayonet with an original um, uh, SS Trotter on it. Yeah, this, uh, this is the one, uh, if you're an icorn collector, this is the one everybody wants. Um, I think I mentioned it. This is the model 3222 Panzer Etch. This is... This you is hear that? Panzer collectors. Yeah. Everybody likes stuff doing with the Panzer core. Yeah, this is the, I consider the coup de grave icorn etch bayonets. This is the one that you want. Unfortunately, I don't have one in a, a long model or we had one to show uh, today, but uh, again, you'll just see again the small. Um, and you want to... Isn't there a tank shown on these on these etches? There is actually a, a tank with skulls underneath and a guy sticking out of the tank. Just yeah. just super, super cool. Yeah. Just ab absolutely love them. And it's listed as a standard pattern in the uh, Icorn Kundendienst, mm -hmm. but uh, try and find one. Try and find one. Yeah. I think a lot of that, too, is because uh, once the war started, uh, Panzer guys weren't out buying bayonets. That's the problem. And there weren't all that many Panzer guys before the war, so you just Correct. don't... Uh, so that probably accounts for some of it. Correct. Uh, very, very desirable, especially with the knot, too. This knot is well used, which really talks to you. you know? <laughs> talks to me, anyhow. I absolutely loved it. So what do we got next? Uh, next is uh, a very special bayonet in, in my collection. This was a um, blue background offering that uh, you just don't see on no, too don't. many etched bayonets. I, I couldn't even tell you one out of how many would, would actually have this. Of course, it was, an extra, it was an extra cost, and just to find one in today's market is just... I, un, I have un, one un, in my collection, you have one, and I know of two others. Same here. And, and you would think that uh, it's the standard uh, 3219 etch. The only thing that's different about it is the bluing. And in the Eichhorn Kundendienst, uh, they, they show uh, uh, somewhere here, if I can find it. Ah, uh, yes. Here we go. Uh, this portion of the catalog uh, shows the blue etches that were available. So probably for about two or three finnigs, I'll have to look out how much it cost, but it was virtually nothing. You could have the, uh, in memory of my service time, uh, with a blue background. But again, times were tough. Um, these guys were all NCOs. They didn't have a lot of money. So for some reason, virtually nobody ordered it. So what should be a common bayonet is one of the rarest of all the Icorn bayonets. With an addition, it took extra time to do. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And don't we find the etch sometimes is a little bit different around the uh, lower eagle on it? And so it seems like they had that blue panel in mind when they made the etch. You, 
well, I can't be in the minds of the master etchers back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just this last piece I just thought I'd show, this is uh, not one of the ones that we wanted to uh, talk about, with a main part of the lecture, but this just happens to be a uh, shooting prize um, produced by uh, Carl Eichhorn, but shows the dual floor de lis on uh, both sides, and this was to a third, uh, third staff guy, and when uh, mm -hmm. I found this with the uh, third staff knot on it, um, it, was, yeah. it was just ab absolutely wild. This came out of a smaller collection in uh, Ohio, and the price was right. No, that's always fun. Yes. Uh, before we get into the pack bayonets, I just wanted to finish a little something on, on this end with uh, mostly icorn. Um, I just wanted to mention that sometimes you'll see bayonets where there is a name professionally um, engraved or etched onto it. Uh, in this case, uh, the name is Helmut Bar, B-A-R, and it's a beautiful bayonet with um, stag grips. Uh, there's no, no maker on it. No maker on the reverse. Um, so we don't know who made it, but um, although they're not considered military etch bayonets, still it was certainly a military fellow that, that had this piece with his name put onto it. Very nice thing. And then another bayonet that we come across uh, from Eichhorn, uh, also Henkels made this bayonet. It just has three words on the blade, uh, and the words are uh, uh, honor, um, hmm, can't think of what the, uh, honor, freedom, and uh, I forget what the middle word is, but uh, they were um, a special order uh, by the uh, NPEA group. There is a record that exists of 200 of these being ordered from uh, uh, the Icorn firm by the NPEA, so that's where we think that they, uh, that they come from. And this one has the, uh, the stamped uh, Icorn trademark. Okay, and then one last piece in the Icorn category. Uh, this is something I'm very proud of. Uh, this bayonet, uh, I think the camera can get it. It's, it's an Icorn short bayonet. It's equipped with uh, stag grip plates. And then in the center of the obverse blade with a blue background, uh, the name of the owner, Gerhard Freimann, is there uh, with some nice floral around it. And then on the reverse, which is an incredible thing, uh, it, it has a, a Kriegs Vinokta in 1941. It was a Christmas present during the war. But what's really incredible about it is there is also an anchor etched here. Uh, and to my knowledge, it is the only etched bayonet that anyone's ever turned up that is directly attributable to the Navy. So it's not only a absolutely gorgeous bayonet, uh, it's important too, uh, because it proves the Navy ordered etched bayonets too. This was probably ordered by a, a sailor's mother uh, to give to him one uh, Christmas sometime. Uh, so now we're gonna go to um, pack bayonets. Okay, we're, uh, we're going to go into the, um, the pack bayonets now, and it's worth mentioning in uh, Wayne Tuckett's book, uh, he's one of the few people in the world that has an original pack catalog, and um, he has a photostat of the model numbers uh, that uh, were standard issue for pack. There were a lot more pack bayonets made than what are shown here, but these are the basic models. And maybe you guys, if you want to click off your video, you can save this page because it's, it's quite important if you're collecting etch bayonets, if you can't get Wayne's book. So with that, we turn it back over to Matt. And here we go. All right. Um, as 
most collectors know uh, you can spot a, a packed bayonet from a mile away because of their offset rivets. Um, always important to know what you're looking at if it's an etch and if it's a pack. If it doesn't have the pack rivets, walk away. But we'll and, and you know what these are, collectors, as opposed to, say, standard rivets. You see the difference? These are rivets, and on the reverse of them, they're retained by a spanner nut. So theoretically, uh, a pack bayonet is the only bayonet that will actually come apart, which is a good and a bad thing. Okay, here so, we go. So just starting down the line, we have the very uh, common neutral etch done by pack, and on these type models, they'll always have the arrowhead bookend with the oak leaves. Very important. Um, moving on, this pattern was in the book. This is known as the um, flagger, again with the arrowhead and the oak leaves. And on the bottom, it's got the little biplane. Flieger. Flieger. I'm sorry. Sorry. Mein Deutsch ist nicht so heiß, so I'm the worst. Uh, moving on, uh, a very rare um, artillery uh, flag piece, um, again with a very small arrowhead and oak leaves on the end towards the blade. Isn't that very nice? This is a. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, it's uh, okay. Yeah, that's that's an interesting match. Another very desirable piece. De desirable piece for uh, collectors is um, the arrowhead with oak leaves, but it has the C thirty one plane on it, and. Uh, this one is compliments of uh, Brian Materer. This one also has the airport designation to it. Um, most of the time you'll just see this with, without the airport de designation. So this is a very, very special piece. So thanks, Brian, for uh, uh, sharing it. Yeah, Brian is a, is a great guy. He has a, a tremendous um, etch bayonet collection, and uh, he was kind enough to lend us um, several really rare bayonets that... Uh, uh, the lecture couldn't be as good without them. And then Pack also had a series of what they call ovals. Um, we don't have all of them here today. Again, they're all in uh, Wayne's uh, book, but the ones that we uh, do have are um, the one example of the eagle and swastika with the helmet underneath, and we have both the short and long examples here to show you. Again, these pack ovals are very, very desirable. I think also um, they're the only producer that we see ovals on. Correct. Is that not true? 100% correct. Yeah. Uh, again, these makers did not share their etches. Ah, that, to your point. Yeah, and, very good. Very and, good. And we'll again later here show the parent company relationships. Um, also in the pack, I believe this is the tank. Collectors, you don't see too many of these. I believe this belongs to Air Wetman here. Thanks for uh, sharing, oh, sir. Yeah. Just absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous piece. And um, also along as the Icorn firm did, pack um, offered the bluing um, option. And we have here the what's called the Bugle Boy uh, oval with the blued background. Um, again, it's a real crowd pleaser that painting. Yeah, just very beautiful. Just lovely to look at. Um, a special order piece. Uh, moving on, um, collectors, you're not going to see too many. Of these, this is a um, example that was uh, given to the people who attended the Rarick Flax School, and I just want to point out that um, it's a very sought-after piece. It's highly faked, 
but one way to know that you've got the real thing is that this is the only etch made in the Third Reich period that does not have borders. You'll see that the actual etches run right to the edge of both sides of the blade. And uh, this uh, this was a school for um, artillerymen, was that it? Uh, black people? Yep. And apparently there must have been a sharp uh, pack salesman that went that, to that school and uh, talked to the graduating class. And a few of those guys uh, bought that bayonet. Not too many because I know of only maybe three or four or five of them that exist. I remember the first time I saw it was about 25 years ago. One came into a show uh, and it was sold about four times before I finally got it and was forced to pay the high price which at that time was two thousand dollars, but these are um, uh, they're, they're probably about three thousand dollars today if you can find one. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, when I bought this piece, I was unemployed and really didn't have the money to buy it, so I just really scraped to get it because I knew it when I saw it, and I know that I'd probably never find another one ever again. So. Pleasure to show it here uh, today. And again, we're going to end off with the uh, packs with another example by Brian Mater. Um, collectors, it doesn't get any minchier than this. Um, this happens to be um, the model of the infantry soldier here at the bottom. Again, with the arrowhead oak leaves tip, as we want to see on pack bayonets. And wouldn't you know it, we've got the original bag original scabbard in 100% full mint condition and factory control tag. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, there's really no better than that. Uh, that's, the, that's the ultimate. Uh, and to have a beautiful bayonet that goes with it to boot is just, um, just phenomenal. Leave it to Brian. <laughs> Next in line is a, an example that uh, Brian Mater was able to um, lend us for today's seminar. This is just a super rare Luftwaffe uh, piece with, you see your uh, eagles and swaz, the typical holler bookends, your Luft eagle, and then if we flip it over, sorry Robbie, but we're going to see, I forget which one to do it, is you're going to see these little airplanes flying through the clouds. This is the first one I have ever ever seen. It's in Wayne's book. Just a beautiful, beautiful example. As uh, speaking before, two holler etches, arrowhead, bookmarks, bookends, and this one is a Luft pattern designated to the Condor Legion. Very, very nice. This might, before you go on, oh, I might yeah. mention that uh, when you find this Condor Legion uh, bayonet, it has no clouds around the uh, airplane. Because there was a later version produced that does have clouds. Thank you, Tom. This we just showed is the neutral pattern, very commonly seen. But we see on this example, it has an artillery scene on it. Very desirable and again with a distinct holler bookends. Moving on to the next is a rare holler scene with the pontoons. Just pioneer then. Pioneer. I don't think this, this one's done. Oh well, look at that. Just absolutely stunning. Next example, Tom, you might want to help me out with this again. It's a collar etch Luftwaffe with your uh, arrowhead bookends, but this is designated to another legion that I'm not familiar with. I'm going to see what... Uh... Yeah, now this, this is the holler etch that was based on the Condor Legion mm -hmm. design, and this was produced during the war whereas the Condor Legion was thought to be well before the war because, as you know, the war uh, where Germany participated in Spain uh, was in uh, 1936 through 1938. 
So this probably came after 1938, as far as we know, anyhow. These two next examples have the arrowhead with oak leaves. Um, these are two re reconnaissance uh, bayonets. Um, one's to a uh, panzer and one's just straight reconnaissance. But here again, this is another type example of a bookend that you will find on a holler etch. And just to show you that there's more than that are two next examples. Um, very uh, common, popular amongst the uh, collectors. For some reason, I haven't memorized. This is the E-103. This is the three scene where it's got the artillery tank, the anti-gun, and the uh, guys coming over the uh, mountains. Just um, Well, it was a matter of expediency for, uh, for Holler. Uh, no matter what uh, type of branch you were in, you could buy that bayonet. It covers everything and they were probably able to keep the price very cheap on that and still satisfy everyone. So that's maybe one of the most common uh, holler etch bed that you see with a three-way scene. That's At least in my experience, I found that. And about six years ago, somebody offered me uh, this uh, bayonet and I gladly purchased it even though I already had one because uh, somebody forgot to flip it over and see that it was uh, attributed. <laughs> so I said, well, yeah. that's one that's got to go in the uh, collection. Yeah, <clears throat> I understand that thinking. <laughs> the disease. The disease. And this last one is a, a rare holler etch that you will see again with these typical bookends, soup bowls or teacups. Um, and this is a an infantry scene with guys on horses. I mean, this is the second example I've uh, ever seen being an icorn guy, only collecting, wanting to collect icorn. When you see something that speaks to you and you want it, you get it. So granted, most of my bayonets are, are icorn, but there are bayonets out there that just catch your eye. And that's what's beautiful about this hobby is that it's very subjective and you find what you like and you collect it. So well, it's true. Huh? It's kind of like women. You you may like a woman for years, and uh oh, here comes another one I like a little bit better, and then the trouble starts. <laughs> but uh, it's it's good that uh, with this disease that we have, <clears throat> when we recognize something that's different, and you will once you get into the hobby. Uh, it's something that is definitely worth pursuing. Maybe not that woman. But, uh, <laughs> definitely a, a, an etch bayonet that's, that's not seen very often. All right. And from here, we're going to move on to the retailers who bought from the Holler firm. We'll be right back. All right. Uh, in the, this next segment now, we're going to uh, uh, go from Holler uh, to the producers that uh, basically used other makers' etches. Is yes. that correct? We're going to refer to these as retailers who had the work done by the manufacturer Holler. And again, you can refer back to the chart that we showed before. And the examples that we have today are WKC, Alcoso, Herder, Lunchloss, and Horster. And you'll see that they were connected and they contracted to have their pieces done by Holler. Before I begin, though, we go to Alcoso. El there were some firms, Alcoso being one of them, that they had their own etches themselves. They handed the bayonet with the etch to the holler firm and said, this is what we want. So with these Alcoso etches, they're the only time that you're going to see these etches is on an El Alcoso blade. But it was made by the holler firm, one of the big five. We'll get into those shortly. So, as with Holler and looking at the bookends, we have the arrow head. And in these two examples, they're basically a neutral etch with the Wehrmacht Eagle. We have a long and short model. But I think there's something special about this one. Oh, yeah. That just, just got a beautiful floral pattern on the back. I saw that. I'm not an icorn guy, but 
or I am an icorn guy, but saw that and I said, I have to have it. It's a nice touch. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I believe this one is also a double to the infantry regiment. I believe it's 41 in Ossenburg. Very, very nice. Moving on to these Alcosos again. Thank you, Mr. Brian Materer, for uh, sharing these. A, a real treat to show to the world. Um, bookends, again, you'll see that have the um, Alcosos own etch, again, in Wayne's book, shown out in great detail. But these are just fantastic pieces. We'll get into this later, but I want you to notice the maker mark. Block lettering. Just remember that. We'll get into that a, a little bit later. But when you see a... Block lettering of Alcoso. Alcoso, yeah. yes. Yeah. Which, by the way, was the mark that Alcoso used from 1937 uh, through late 1939. Right. Um, a bayonet here that does not have a military citation, but was a special order piece to a Panzer regiment. These two examples here were made by, uh, I should say, were made for the Herder firm. And this one was attributed to Panzer, Panzer Regiment 37. That's a rare bayonet too. Yeah. Yeah. And that was Herder. Yeah. Herder. And this next one is one you don't see any day every day, but that is one of the uh, in inverted etches. Um, yeah, they're great. Yeah. Every... The, the, the process there was uh, instead of, um, um, well, they reversed the, uh, instead of having the background with a, with a, um, uh, an etch panel, an etch um, uh, darkening, uh, they made the eagle dark and left the background bright. Uh, it's a very rare uh, bayonet and highly, highly desirable. And only Herber, I believe, made that. I don't remember seeing any others. That's the only one that I'm aware of, Tom. Yeah. Then another firm that contracted through Holler was the PD Lunch Loss firm. And this one is uh, attributed to a Panzer unit, number 37. Again, I want you to pay particular attention to the maker's mark. That's what you want to see on a period lunch loss etched bayonet. So remember that. What's, what's so special about that maker's mark? Is not only one, that's what we want to see on etched bayonets, but the what we see on later pieces post 45, yeah. they tend to be on reproductions. Again, yeah. Yeah. we haven't seen every bayonet, yeah. but if you ever see the double oval lunch loss on a mesh bayonet, take caution. Yeah. I'm not gonna say it's bad, yeah. but take extreme you just, caution. You wanna see the old fashioned fire helmet with the sword going through it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah. And we do have one example for uh, Forster, and this one we will see with the bookends of uh, oak leaves uh, embraced with the arrowhead, which mm -hmm. Holler also did. So, yeah. we'll be moving on in the next section here shortly. So where are we going next now? Next, we're going to go over to the class firm. I like the class bayonets. You like them, Tom? Yeah, I do. I like class bayonets. Well, let's show you a couple. All right. So over here, we have a couple examples. Um, one is just a interesting pattern that's featured in uh, Wayne's book that just has, uh, in memory of my service time, written in the... Uh, 
fuller with the uh, helmet and swaz on the Ricasso. Just but, but look yeah. how they look how they brought out the the helmet and swaz on the Ricasso by shading the back areas and just shading the fuller area uh, to bring out the etch. Yeah. Uh, that's unique that I know of. I don't know of any yeah. anything else that looks like that. That's one of my favorite bayonets. <laughs> And the next couple that we uh, have here, um, class used two different um, bookends. This one that we're looking at now is called the Curled Cross. Um, that was one that they used after um, we look at the next example, which is called their um, Potted Plant Bookends. I might also mention, too, when you, when you see this Curled Cross uh, that's a very, very old Germanic design that will even appear on uh, medieval armor that's German made. So it's, and it's also, you'll recognize it um, as the uh, clip on a model 1936 chained SS. So that's something that was typically Germanic. Yes. So again, typical bookends for class was the curled cross and these bookends uh, here. Um, another retailer from the classroom was the Emil Vus company, and here we're lucky enough to have a example made by them with uh, the Wehrmacht Eagle flanked by oak leaves, which is a rare pattern. Yeah. Most, of, most of the time you just see the eagle and not flanked with uh, oak leaves. And this looks like a pattern that was probably made uh, about 1937, we started to see that stop when we have mm -hmm. this 45 degree bend stop. I think it's also interesting that the etch is on the reverse blade, not on the obverse. And then the Emil Vus trademark. And the next piece, um, again, is a special order piece. Um, featured in Wayne's book, um, and this was made by Peter Daniel Krebs. Again, we know it was made by the class firm because of the bookends known as the Twisted Cross. It's really great though, isn't it, with the artillery piece right in the center there, and it's really, really terrific. And right there it says Christmas War 1940. Again, another piece I just had to have. That would be a special order piece, right? Because of the uh, the, the, the uh, Christmas etch on the on the front. Wayne refers to it as a uh, deluxe pattern. Yeah, and that's all that I can say. In another one, you think they actually had? You could order this at the factory. I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> Too much guessing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Mm. And another Krebs uh, pattern, very simple, but in memory of my service time, running along the bottom of the uh, blade. Don't see too, too many of them, but, you know, it's a different maker's it's, mark. And, and it's, it's nice and neat. Yeah. And it's, it's, it has appeal yeah. to it. Yeah. And the last uh, one in the row here we're going to show is made by the Spitzer firm. Uh, this is one that everybody wants, probably because it's on the cover of Wayne's book. It's considered one of the busiest etches that was ever made. But greatly done. But greatly done. Greatly yeah. done, and that's why it's on the cover of Wayne's book. He likes it, too. Yeah. Um, every one of these that I've ever had, which are quite rare, actually, they sell instantly. Everybody wants one of those, and, and they're very, very spitzer. You don't see many etch bayonets. No. And that, that is a really a truly great etch. I don't think I've ever seen one that's a double, but I guess it could exist. I mean, who knows? Like I said, we haven't seen them all yet. Yeah. All right, and so uh, where do we go from here now? Well, we just go here to the last of the major five uh, producers, Puma. Puma, yeah. Puma. Uh, Puma did not sell it out to anybody else. Pumas yeah. just did Pumas. Yeah. And Pumas are known by their uh, signature spaghetti-style bookends, and uh, just the the three that I brought today, um, all take note, are on the reverse and not the obverse. I don't know if that's the rule, 
but in my 20 years, every Puma etch that I've seen has been on the reverse. Yeah, we should maybe look at the Puma catalog and see <laughs> how they show it, but uh, I agree with you, they're always on the reverse. Yeah. So I think we got one that's an artillery, one's a flak, and I can't remember the other one, but it had a, a pioneer hilt, so I said. That's it. Yeah, that's interesting too with a pioneer hilt again. Yeah. So that rounds up uh, the big five and who bought from them. I apologize that uh, we didn't have every maker mark. Um, I know we didn't have uh, CD shaft or uh, Shell hammer, there's you know, yeah. Tiger, but Steer, the, yep, Steyr. Steyr. Uh, so, um, uh, you can never collect everything, and uh, but we did our best to uh, assemble as many uh, examples as we could. Yeah. And uh, I dare to say, um, uh, uh, it's a pretty difficult job. And uh, thank goodness we had the um, uh, some of my stuff. Some of Mater stuff, and of course, mostly your stuff. Uh, so we, I think, we had a pretty good um, representation. Um, we're going to take a minute and um, show you um, a couple of fake bayonets and some of the attributes that you can look for on um, fake items to help save everybody yeah. thousands and thousands Down of up. dollars. Which. Get the book. Get the book. Study the book. <laughs> Talk to your friends. Uh, there's a lot of people that collect these things. I mean, they may only have two or three of them, but you never know what's going to be in somebody's collection. And uh, uh, we're always learning, um, which is just uh, back to Wayne Tekkett again, how he knew all this in 2002 is just amazing to me. Uh, I remember selling etch bayonets back in the 1970s. Nobody knew what they were. Uh, they were 50 bucks in some cases. I was always more expensive than anybody else. So I was trying to get a hundred and a quarter, but they just sat on my table. It really was not until Wayne and his genius by putting all these things to text, studying what they were, figuring out the rarities uh, that really produced a whole different market. And that's why we refer to him as the godfather. He is the godfather. And it's, it's like Matt said at the beginning of the lecture, there's daggers, there's swords, and there's ex bayonets. And they really are a whole complete field unto themselves. Well, aren't they pretty? Yeah. And they are very, very pretty. And... Um, Prettiness always produces dollars, too, in the end. Good investment. Absolutely. Yeah. So now we'll show you some reproduction stuff. All right. All right. Uh, before we leave the um, etched bayonet subject and go to the fakes and phonies, uh, we thought it would also be appropriate to talk about another extra that was available through the Icorn firm. Uh, and that was etching of the branch of service on the pommel of the bayonet. Um, in the Eichhorn Kundendienst, which is shown here, uh, these were the available etches that you could get on your pommel. Uh, and you'll note it's not just a coincidence, but they're the same etches that also appeared on the blades and that was a matter of cost cutting, you know, they already had the templates made. Um, and again, just like the blue panels and other things, this cost extra money and you just almost never ever see pommel etches. And what you got to watch out for too, notice the word I use is etch because you will see pommels with these branch of service engraved into the pommel. Uh, those are fakes. Those are post-war done. Whenever you buy something with a pommel etch, which is a very, very rare thing to begin with, it has to be etched, and it has to be just like the Kundendienst shows. 
Now, um, Matt's going to show you here what we see on pommel edges. All right. I can't overemphasize how rare these are to find in the collecting uh, community. 90% um, of what you find with pommel etches are fake. And you can tell by the way that they're done. They're very lightly done. They're very sl sloppily done, even if that's a word. These etchers were masters. They took time in what they did. Um, Tom just mentioned the six that were in the Icorn catalog. But wouldn't you know, there was a seventh with the two gulls uh, f flying away. I've actually seen three others, so I know that they, they were out there. So this did a, um, a appeal to the uh, fly boys. Was that the etch that didn't appear in the catalog? Correct. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. to even find it on a, a pommel etch, yeah. just a, extremely rare. Um, next is an infantry etch. Again, very deeply done, very well done, very precisely done. Um, again, to find them, just in incredibly, incredibly rare. And um, uh, lastly, um, my friend LaRue Curran lent me his example of the Wehrmacht Eagle. Um, this is probably the most common one you will find, of maybe the five that I've seen, but, and everyone has a little bit of the burnish in it. Don't ask me why. Yeah, I but, agree with that. But that's the way the Wehrmacht Eagle came. Mm -hmm. And now that this is on, on video, I'm sure the price of this probably just doubled. So yeah. thanks, LaRue. But um, again, yeah. an extra factor. Um, you know, I, I had a um, beautiful pommel etch with the Wehrmacht Eagle uh, that I sold to an advanced collector. And I sent it to him in New York and it got lost in the mail. Oh. It, uh, who knows whatever happened to it. It, it couldn't have been just a regular bayonet. No, it had to be a pommel edge. Oh. Really tragic, that kind of stuff. So if you so collect, some guy yeah. that works in the post office, he has a pommel etch and probably doesn't even know how rare it is. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, okay, mm -hmm. and uh, now with that, uh, we're going to go to try to give you some uh, tips on um, on reproduction bayonets. Uh, I know this is um, what we've shown you. Are, I, I guess it was a couple hundred bayonets, and I know you can't, you know, uh, absorb all that uh, uh, easily. Uh, and then on top of it, we have to make it worse. Yes, there are fakes too. And um, if you want to save yourself a lot of money, you want to take the time uh, to learn what the real pieces are. But we're going to show you um, just a few pieces, a couple pieces, uh, where there are obvious fakes, uh, and you'll be able to tell right away if you just watch what we, what we show you. Mm. All right. Uh, if you want to All right. give us a, a tour with these things. All right. Well, first I want to point out that um, Wayne Tackett, he... Uh, did a whole chapter on reproductions because he thought that it was uh, that important. And I know everyone, this has been a, a longer video, but this next couple minutes might be the best time you could ever spend watching a video on uh, etched bayonets. So could save you a lot of money. Oh uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of money. So what I do as a collector is I start out from the top of the bayonet and I work my way down. Um, here we have a, a reproduction, and when I say I start from the top and I work my way down, first I look at the Mortise key. If you can tell, it's very bulbous, there's seams. Um, I'm going to put it next to a proper Mortise key, and you can see how very little seams, it's very flat. These will just stick out to you like anything I've ever seen in my life. So that right there can they be They will if you know. If you know. If you know. This is very important, collectors, yeah. to really look at that. You don't ordinarily see a mortise key that's obvious. They're so flush to the surface on real pieces. Next point down, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but on this Wiresberg piece, notice how much higher the stud button is 
would you say it's about a, a, a third taller? Always another red flag on a reproduction bayonet. Um, then I move down to the grips. Um, have they been messed with? Um, in stag versions, uh, the, uh, the reproduction guys always get it wrong. You'll always see some sort of a rim hole around uh, where the uh, rivet tried to go in. Um, these actually grips don't look too bad. Um, the the re newer reproductions, it'll be very white. These are actually toned, but still with what we're talking about and them being very chunky. They're very thick. Very, thicker very, than what you'd see normal. And the reason they're toned is I bought this bayonet in 1977 and had it in my collection for years before I realized it was a fake. Then from there, we move to the quillion. And what the reproduction guys always mess up is they always, I shouldn't say always, but most of the time leave a casting flaw and it's very noticeable. The seam runs, you can see the seam on it. If you see that casting mark, again, there's another red flag. Then from there, I'll go to the blade itself. Um, we're gonna flip it over. Now I'm gonna use my words carefully here. We see Paul Weyersberg. Paul Weyersberg did not make etched bayonets with military citations between 1932 and 1945. Yes, they made presentation bayonets, shooting prizes, all sorts of things. But today, again, our lecture was on military citation etched bayonets. Um, so when you see that, take pause. Um, and from here, again, they just didn't do them. Um, so I'll say lastly, too, yes. and this is, this is really important, on these um, 70s done uh, etch bayonets, um, they all have a washer on them. And the reason they have a washer is because it won't come off. The washer is actually positioned between the blade shoulders and the hilt of the bayonet. On original bayonets, the washer is just slipped over the blade and it will come off. That's why a lot of washers are missing on original bayonets. If you have a bayonet where the washer will not come off because it's stuck behind the shoulders of the blade, 99.9 uh, .9 times it's going to be a phony. The only original one I ever saw was a, a bayonet made by Steer and uh, maybe they had their own way of doing things. But for the most part, if that washer won't come off, uh, you're probably in trouble. Um, the etching on this Wiresburg bayonet is actually fantastic. It, it really great. is. It looks really nice. It really looks great. There's, a, there's a, like a little a motorized um, howitzer gun that's pulling a tank, or not a tank, but another, I mean, it's very um, enticing when you see it. It was to me when I first bought it. Uh, and it's really disheartening when you think you have something yeah. fantastic and it's a piece of crap. Um, but I hope that that'll, there's a lot of things here, a lot of red flags just on one bayonet that can tell you a lot about what to, uh, look for on reproductions. And don't forget, the position of the mortise lock is very, very important. And back to the uh, etch, uh, one very important thing to look at in the etch itself, and we have a picture of it here of a reproduction 3219 Carl Eichhorn. Look at the size of those borders. Totally wrong. On a, uh, on a period piece, you'll see that that etch goes right up almost to the end Mm -hmm. edges of the uh, blade. So bookends, or not bookends, sorry, borders, very, very important. And lastly, <laughs> this piece is one that I would say, even though that I've been doing it for 20 years, even five or 10 years into the hobby, this one would have fooled me. Fool so most people. So what we have here, collectors, is a pack bayonet. How do we know it's pack? The offset rivets. 
not maker's mark, but that's okay. We know that it's Pack. And then from what we learned before, who did Pack make etch bayonets for? They did it for themselves, and according to Wayne's chart, they just did it for one other company, Hackwack, Hackwack, and Steyer. Right? Steyer and who? And themselves. That was yeah, it. Pack and Steyer. Yeah. So what do we have? What do we have on? <laughs> and what do we have on on this blade? We have a class etch. And. We just know that they did not do that, so there's a term where I'm from, that dog don't hunt. Um, I know we can't get in on it, but if you got under a magnifying glass, you would see that these um, bookends are incomplete, and there's a line here at the end that has a big flaw in it. So it would have probably not likely have left the uh, factory like that if, if, if it was real, but a class etch on a pack blade, no good. Let me just say something else, too, for the repro artists that want an easy job. Remember, the pack hilt comes off by merely unscrewing the spanner screws, and you can completely re-hilt a blade uh, to this piece. Probably a lot of us guys could do it in our cellar. Yeah. Um, so a pack was a, a real candidate for putting a, flake, a fake blade in because it was a very easy job. Um, it's interesting to note too what I remember I said about the washer. Again, the washer won't come off because it's behind the shoulders of the blade. Remember that too. That's a, that can save you a fortune, just that stupid little thing. So, okay. Yeah, and I know that uh, in one of Wayne's last videos, he talked about transporting bayonets and distributing them. And I've done the same ever since I started. Once I've collected in my possession, have a bayonet, it never goes back in the scabbard. You're just going to save on condition. So if you ever pick one up, store it out of the scabbard. Or if you're going to mail it to somebody, put it in a case, put the blade in, have it wrapped around and mailed. Therefore, the new owner of that bayonet will know that you took care of what you wanted it to be done for. Because even, even though the runners were finally done in bayonets, they're very tight because in German bayonets, when you turn them upside down, the bayonet didn't fall out. But every time you get that nickel-plated blade running against those runners, there's a certain amount of material that can wear off. So why do it? And again, just real, real quick, anything with an El Coso script maker mark, you want to be very careful of. Again, this is the lunch loss maker mark that you want to see. Um, there's a lot of reproduction SMF etch, or uh, dress bayonets out there etched. Yeah. They didn't make them. No. When, uh, when we say script, um, with the standard El Coso logo, uh, the word, the word Alcozo is written in block letters in an arch across the scales. Uh, if you see it written in script writing, cursive, if you will, uh, that is not going to be an original piece. Yeah. And of course, again, and if you see the word Max Weyersberg, that's almost an automatic yeah. walk away. Yeah. We don't know of any original Max no, Weyersberg no. pieces. And, and, uh, uh, the Godfather, Wayne Tuckett, told me with red flags, three strikes and you're out. So that's sort of the rules to live by yeah. with collecting these little devils. So on that, I think we've um, uh, we've told you everything that we can. Uh, maybe we forgot a few stuff. It wasn't intentional, <laughs> but we tried to tell you as much as we could, and uh, hopefully the camera work and all picked up. Uh, a lot of information. So we know it's a long video, but it's worthwhile if you want to collect bayonets. And I can't emphasize more, as we said before, they're extremely beautiful uh, and they are definitely a good investment. So we thank, we thank you for uh, watching this. And uh, again, we hope it was useful. 
uh, and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you in the next video. And thank you so much. Tell me your name again. Matt Janowski. J A N O W S K I, <laughs> and we'll put it up on the video with uh, Matt's email in the event that um, you want to uh, correspond with him. Uh, Matt welcomes any emails. Uh, and just like me, he's glad to help you. That's what the hobby's all about. So we'll see you uh, the next time. Thanks again, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was really good. Absolute pleasure. Appreciate Tom. it. Okay.